Every search you make, every click you take, they'll be watching you. Tired of companies like Google and Facebook watching everything you do online? There's actually a simple solution. DuckDuckGo. It's an all-in-one privacy app with a built-in private search engine, web browser, one-click data clearing, email protection, and more. All for free. Download the app today and get the most comprehensive privacy protection with a push of a button. DuckDuckGo. Privacy simplified. Hello, everyone. This is Rosie Tran, and welcome to Stupid Sexy Privacy, a Weibo.tv special report sponsored by our friends at DuckDuckGo. You may have heard my voice at the end of every episode on Weibo.tv. I'm the one asking you to leave a review. Which, by the way, I hope you've done, right? You've left us a review? Okay, great. Unless you're lying. <clears throat> well, I'm a lot more than a voice. I'm also Weibo.tv's intrepid reporter, and over the course of this miniseries, I'm going to share with you short, actionable tips you can use to protect your privacy. These tips were sourced by our fearless leader, he really hates when we call him that, BJ Mendelson. BJ, for those of you who may not know, is the author of the book Privacy and How We Get It Back, a book that was published in the before times. This means before COVID. BJ is currently writing a sequel called How to Protect Yourself from Fascists and Weirdos. So everything we're going to hear in this miniseries is the most up-to-date information he's researched, bringing us into 2023 and beyond. Throughout the series, you're also going to hear from some special guests and experts in the information security field. You hear that sound? That means it's time for today's privacy tip. This week is part of our two-part digital detox spiel. The reason we cover this is simple. Everyone listening to the show has a smartphone. And the odds are good you probably use it more than you'd like. Well, there are also some excellent privacy reasons to cut back on how often you use your smartphone. Specifically, the more you use it, the more data it collects and shares with other parties. This includes the location data of everywhere you go. And we mean everywhere. And while we're not suggesting you ditch your smartphone and get yourself a jitterbug, if we can get you to use your phone just a little bit less, we've successfully shrunk your online footprint. And that helps to keep you and your family safe from fascists and weirdos. So let's start with a simple exercise and a few helpful tips. When was the last time you went through all the apps on your phone? And I mean, really went through them. It's probably been a while, huh? So take a few minutes after listening to this podcast and break out your smartphone and privacy notebook. Because this week, you're going to go through every app on your phone and uninstall the ones you're not using. Does that include your social media apps? We'll get to that, but you'll definitely want to uninstall Twitter. Twitter is now a cesspool for the alt-right and their friends to gather, which is different from the cesspool that it was before. Because this time, Elon Musk peed in the cesspool and then filled it with Nazis. Unused apps on your phone expose you to security vulnerabilities, so the fewer of them you have, the better. We recommend setting some time aside once a month to clean out your phone. This will establish a good habit of removing unused apps regularly. Doing so will help keep you and your friends and family safe from any security breaches caused by those apps. In step two of this exercise, we want you to think critically about the apps you want to keep. Once you remove your unused apps, take out your privacy notebook and write down the apps you've decided to keep. Then write down why you decided to keep the apps that you did. If you can't come up with a good reason to keep those remaining apps, you should delete them immediately. Can't stress how important this exercise is. Writing down why you kept the apps and that you did helps to clarify in your mind why you have them in the first place. This is also a good opportunity if you use certain apps way too much to write down how often you like to use them. Once you've done that, both Apple and Android phones have features that will let you limit how long you can use certain apps each day. We'll link to how to do that in this episode's show notes. Okay, let's wrap up today's episode with a couple of quick digital detox tips. Once you're done with this exercise, remove all of the remaining apps from your home screen. Your home screen should always be blank. This adds an extra layer of friction when you mindlessly reach for your phone. And speaking of friction, if you're going to keep any social media apps on your phone, make sure you sign out of them. While removing social media apps from your phone entirely is the best practice, we know that might not always be possible. Signing out of these apps will prevent you from looking at them without purpose, which honestly is most of the time what we go to look at these things. Social media apps can be a lot of fun, but you also don't want to give them all of your time and data. That's because none of these companies can be trusted. Just ask BJ. He wrote a book about that like a decade ago. Are you still listening? We hope so because we have a special surprise. Back in 2017, BJ's first book on privacy came out. 
It was called Privacy and How We Get It Back. Broadway actor Roger Wayne did the narration for the audio edition of the book. Our editor, Andrew, was nice enough to go through the audiobook and pull out the sections that are still very much worth sharing with you today. So if you stick around and listen to this miniseries, after every privacy tip, you'll hear another excerpt from BJ's book, Privacy and How We Get It Back. Take it away, Roger. Eight. Big data, bigger business. Earlier, I explained that your data is valuable, and that's why so many non-government entities want to invade your privacy. The more data that companies can get, the more money they can make off you. This has been in practice since the beginning of the internet boom, when Netscape Navigator was harvesting data on their users to monetize. In theory, by using an internet platform or app service, you're aware of what the company is doing to collect your data since you read the terms of service. But the reality is, nobody reads these agreements, and every company knows that. Companies, especially those that collect data by being creepy, have incentive to change their terms of service often, and without warning, to justify some of their more dubious data collection practices. In 2011, for example, Dropbox altered their terms of service, briefly, to claim they owned all your stuff that was uploaded to their service. In October of 2017, Patreon changed its privacy policy to prohibit the use of their site to support adult content creators. The contract you agree to, the terms of service, may in theory protect you, but it actually does the opposite as it can be changed on a whim. So here I want to provide you with some examples of this invasion of privacy, as well as explain what's going on within the world of the tech that fuels this behavior. Verizon and Google's Creepy Behavior No matter how evolved we like to think we are, we humans still very much operate under the ancient credo of monkey see, monkey do. For example, if you see your friends passing around a funny video, you're likely to pass on that same video. Partly because you think the video is indeed funny, but mostly because you want others to think you're funny. Your friend then gets the video and goes through the same process, usually sharing it for the same reason. We're herd animals, even when we pretend to be individuals. For those of you who watch South Park, there's an episode where Stan goes and joins the goth kids at school. They all want to be nonconformists, but in doing so, the goth kids all look, act, and talk the same, which Stan points out. In a lot of ways, we're all those goth kids, whether we like it or not. And that goes double for employees of large companies in a very competitive space. So if a large multi-billion dollar tech company is doing something creepy to collect data, then it's more than reasonable to assume smaller companies looking to have multi-billion dollar valuations themselves will do the same. Paths Dave Morin provided us with one such example already. But let me give you two more examples of what I'm talking about from the history of the Internet. AOL These days, it's easy to forget AOL exists, especially now that it goes by the super-dumb Orwellian name of Oath after Verizon bought it. But if you rewind the clock to 1994, back when you needed AOL or a similar service provider to access the Internet, AOL was massive. At one point, AOL was so big they bought Time Warner, not the other way around, as is often reported. How did AOL get so valuable? They made money from people by using advertising, branded partnerships, and subscription services. The company very quickly developed the nasty habit of collecting and selling their users' data without permission. In 1996, after the media called them out on this behavior, it appeared AOL had backed off from the practice. Three years later, though, AOL actually revised their terms of service without informing their users to allow the company to sell user data to their business partners without consequence. They backed off after another media backlash, which, as I hope you're starting to see, is an incredibly common pattern. Even today, as we saw with the Samsung Smart TV incident, where it was revealed by Samsung in their privacy policy that the smart TV's remote includes a microphone that potentially could listen in and record your conversations while you're holding the remote, a company will try to collect data in a creepy way, be confronted by media or consumers, and then back off only to try again later. AOL is important to note here because it's one of the first instances of an Internet platform selling user data without the user's permission or knowledge. Today, that's common practice. 
Just ask Google and Amazon, who, under new EU privacy laws, will have to inform customers that their Echo and Home devices are always listening to them, no matter what those companies say about the devices only activating when they hear their watchword. I'm a Facebook hipster. I then deleted my Facebook account and then re-upped it in 2005 and have not been able to get off the stupid thing since. So so why can't you get off? So what, <laughs> what are your... <laughs> you guys. The award-winning Smashing Security Podcast, hosted by Graham Cluley and Carol Terrio each week. It takes an irreverent look at cybersecurity and online privacy. Helping you find out what's happening with your data. Find it in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all good podcast apps, or at smashingsecurity.com. It's not all filth. Speaking of Google... Google. To provide just one example of the numerous instances where Google has done something creepy to you, I'd like to mention the often reported Street View incident from 2010. First, because I just told you the Google Home devices are kind of creepy, but also because this is at the top of my list of all time creepy things Google has done to gather your data. In 2010, as Google vans were driving around the country taking those highly useful street view pictures that can be found when using Google Maps, the company was also scooping up any data that anyone had received or sent using nearby unsecured Wi-Fi connections. Meaning that if someone had just sent a dick pic to someone else over a Wi-Fi connection that wasn't password protected, it was very likely that Google now had that picture and could use it in some capacity. Google, for their part, tried to claim that they'd collected the data accidentally. As time went on, Google changed their story and said everything sent over unsecured Wi-Fi was public and therefore their data harvesting was not illegal in the first place. U.S. Judge James Ware disagreed and eventually Google apologized, paid a fine, and claimed to have stopped collecting data via Street View vans. However, that is not the end of this story. As of 2017, Google is still appealing the case, and they even tried to have it heard before the Supreme Court. The case in question is Joffe v. Google Inc., for those curious. Where the case currently stands, the judge determined that Google's activity was, in fact, illegal. Consider for a moment that this practice was something Google had claimed to have been doing accidentally, then claimed they were no longer doing, but still tried to contest the issue in court later. That should strike anyone as a bit odd. If Google knew what they were doing was wrong and have claimed to stop doing it, why continue to contest the legality of their data collection methods? Recall again just how valuable your data is. And even though Google has already made many people wealthy, it still has a business to run and obligations to fulfill for its shareholders. Being one of the most prominent tech companies today, like AOL was back in 1994, it's reasonable to assume that other tech companies are observing Google's behavior and have opted to take similar approaches to collecting your data. Monkey see, monkey do. Another quick example of monkey see and monkey do. Foursquare, like Twitter, burst onto the tech scene with a lot of tech and mainstream media attention before quickly floundering. In their defense, Foursquare changed their business model and are now doing quite well for themselves by selling your data. Surprise! But that's not why I wanted to tell you about them. In a similar fashion to Google's harvesting of data available on the routers of unsuspecting users, Foursquare made a change in their app to allow it to constantly track users. This was a quiet change from what the app originally allowed users to do, which was to check in upon arriving at a location. And although that may not sound so bad, I haven't mentioned the best part, this tracking, in the words of the blog Consumerist, doesn't just take place when mobile users open the app, though. It takes place literally any time their phones are powered on. Even if you've just booted up your phone and have forgotten that Foursquare was ever installed on there, 
It's now watching where you go. The connection between Foursquare and Google? Google had purchased what was the precursor to Foursquare, Dodgeball. And the Dodgeball co-founders left Google after some time to start Foursquare. Monkey see, Google. Monkey do, Foursquare. Most things people hate about the internet comes from a lack of privacy, like those creepy ads that make you think your phone is listening to you. DuckDuckGo is an all-in-one privacy app that can help you with that. It's your internet browser with private search, tracking blocker, encryption, and even built-in email protection, all for free. Just go to DuckDuckGo.com to learn more. DuckDuckGo, privacy simplified. Thank you for listening to Stupid Sexy Privacy, a Weiwo.tv special report. Do you need a privacy audit? To help find new episodes of Weiwo.tv, BJ is offering one-on-one privacy audits. These are private, one-time consultations that are conducted securely through Signal. During the audit, BJ will walk you through all 23 steps from our special report to help you better protect your privacy. Now, just to be clear, we're going to share all 23 steps with you here, for free, in this podcast miniseries. Because these are all tactics you can use right now to help protect yourself from fascists and weirdos, and we want to help keep everyone safe. These privacy audits are meant for people who may need some extra help implementing these steps or have additional questions that they want answered. You can have your one-on-one privacy audit with BJ by sending an email to bjmendelson at duck.com. That email again is bjmendelson at duck.com. And we'll see you next time right here on weiwo.tv, right? Right?